Okay, I think we can get started. Some people are very last minute, um, but uh, let's get started. So hello and welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our seminar, ASIC seminar series. Um, I'm John, the seminar coordinator. Together with me is Ms. Kathy Medany. Kathy and I will be today's moderator. And um, we are glad that um, our director, um, Adam Williams, um, also join us. And we'll be introducing a speaker before she gets started. And just so you know that um, the seminar is being recorded and the video will be later published on our ASIC uh, YouTube channel. So feel free to check it out. And today we are going to have our speaker, um, Professor um, I, um, Adel Aido, uh, joining us from the UC Davis. And before she gets started, um, I will need um, Anna to introduce the speaker. Anna, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, John. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Eigel. She is an associate professor in atmospheric science at University of California, Davis, and is uh, also currently serving as the editor for the Journal of the Atmospheric Sciences. She earned her master's degree and PhD degrees at Colorado State University, working on warm phase microphysical processes. She's the head of the cloud physics group at UC Davis, which has a research focus, including microphysics parameterizations, Arctic mixed phase clouds, and cloud droplet size distribution. Her research is supported by the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, and the Office of Naval Research through a Young, Young Investigator Award, in that case to study marine fog off the coast of California and around the world. We're very pleased to have her with us today uh, to present her cider, her uh, seminar on polar and subtropical low-level clouds and interactions with aerosol particles. Welcome, Dr. Igel. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. So let me get situated over here. All right. So yeah, so today I'll be talking about um, low level clouds in the Arctic and the subtropics and their interactions with aerosol particles. And before I get started, I would just like to say that this, uh, the work I'm presenting today has had contributions for a number of people, um, including many of my students, um, Lucas, Abby, and Kevin, um, and collaborators elsewhere, um, Inez, Annika, Joe, Heather, and uh, Neely. So let me just start by giving a really broad overview of low-level clouds and um, why we feel that they're important. So here's a, here's a map showing low-level cloud fraction as derived from CloudSat and Calypso over most of the globe. And you can see that there are areas typically located off of the uh, western coast of continents where we have very high cloud fraction um, exceeding 60 or, or 70, 80 percent um, in these regions, many of them here are box. Um, so again, these, these areas are very extensive. They are low clouds and they reflect a very large fraction of the incoming solar radiation. And as such, they are especially important for regulating climate. And of course, aerosol is known to modulate the reflectivity and the fractional coverage of these clouds. And so uh, in, in recent years, uh, we have spent quite a bit of time trying to understand exactly how aerosols modulate these clouds um, and what their impacts are on, on the climate. So there we go. Um, what this map doesn't really show very well, though, is that we also have uh, persistent low-level clouds in the Arctic. And so here I'm showing some maps, and I apologize because I don't have the, the reference um, for these figures. Uh, that's an oversight on my part. Um, but we have persistent low-level clouds in the Arctic as well, and this is here showing it by season. You can see that in the in polar winter months in particular, the low cloud fraction, again, um, can exceed 70, 80, 90 percent, as we saw it also did in the subtropics. Um, and these, these clouds in the Arctic are, are also important, um, not only for their ability to reflect sunlight, but um, in the Arctic, there's also been quite a bit of uh, discussion about um, their impact on the surface energy balance and their links to, to sea ice uh, melt. So when I say low level clouds today, what I'm, I'm really primarily talking about are stratocumulus clouds rather than cumulus clouds. And so I just want to give a brief overview of stratocumulus clouds in case you're not familiar with these 
So here I'm showing a schematic diagram from, from Wood 2012, which highlights the major processes that are important for controlling these clouds. So these are, these are spatially extensive clouds. Again, they exist at the top of the boundary layer. Um, so cloud top is usually very well constrained by the boundary layer top and cloud base is, is less constrained. And there are a number of processes that are important for controlling the amount of liquid in these clouds and whether or not they're uh, drizzling. So among those processes, of course, um, is the turbulent mixing in the in the boundary layer, which is often driven by fluxes of surface uh, fluxes of energy and moisture from the surface. We have um, latent heating due to condensation within the cloud. We have evaporative cooling at cloud top, which can generate locally cold air that can uh, further contribute to some turbulent mixing. And then on top of these clouds, of course, is the free troposphere. The free troposphere is typically, um, uh, at least immediately above the cloud layer, much warmer and also much drier than the boundary layer. And we get entrainment of this warm, dry air into the clouds, and that can generate, again, um, evaporation near cloud top. And then um, lastly, but certainly not, not least of all, we have uh, radiative processes. So we have um, sunlight coming in and being reflected off the top of these clouds or perhaps um, contributing to some solar heating within the cloud. And these clouds uh, are also, of course, emitting uh, uh, long wave radiation continuously contributing to cooling, particularly at cloud top. So uh, a little bit now, a little bit of background now about stratocumulative clouds and aerosol. So as we increase the amount of uh, aerosol available to these clouds, we expect um, two, two major changes. One, I've already alluded to, that's the reflectivity of the clouds or the albedo. Um, and this is, again, of, of importance if you want to understand the climate impact of these clouds. And so here I'm showing a formula for the albedo. And what you see is that there are terms that depend here just on the number concentration in the clouds, but there's also a term over here that depends on how the liquid water path changes with a change in the, in the droplet concentration. And so over here, I'm showing um, a summary of our understanding of how the liquid water path will change as the droplet concentration changes. And what we have found really is that there are two, two regimes. At relatively low aerosol concentration, an increase in the concentration will lead to an increase in the liquid water path. And this is typically associated with the suppression of drizzle. Um, and with as that drizzle is suppressed, more liquid remains in the cloud. Um, but you get to a, a tipping point eventually uh, where further increases in aerosol concentration um, results in a decrease in liquid water path. And in this regime, typically um, the clouds are already not precipitating and further increases in aerosol result again in a, uh, in a decrease. And I'll, I'll be talking more about the physical mechanisms associated with that decrease uh, later in the talk. Uh, right now, I just want to point out that we have these two, two different regimes depending on where we are in terms of aerosol concentration. Um, I want to further discuss um, Arctic low-level clouds in particular and their relationship with aerosol. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the clouds in the Arctic uh, have a role in the surface energy budget as well as the top of the atmosphere um, energy budget. And what's maybe um, different or unique about the low-level clouds in the Arctic is that they can be quite thin compared to their subtropical um, cousins. And because of this thinness, what we have found is that the droplet properties can impact both the long wave and the short wave um, cloud forcing from these clouds. And this is a figure demonstrating that from Ritzen et al. Um, 2011. Uh, and the basic idea here is that because these clouds are so thin, they're not really acting like uh, black bodies yet. And uh, an increase in aerosol concentration can increase the liquid water in these clouds and increase um, or move these clouds closer to a black body type regime, increase the amount of radiation that is being emitted both upwards and downwards. Um, and the downward component in particular is important for the, the surface energy budget. Um, and this, this, this sort of response is particularly important when the aerosol concentrations or the CCN concentrations, CCN being those special aerosol particles that can uh, contribute to cloud droplet formation um, when those concentrations are less than about 10 per cubic centimeter. And uh, while that, that's a pretty low number, um, that is a number that, that we, we do observe in the Arctic on a, on a relatively frequent basis, especially in the high Arctic, um, far from land mass. And so that, this is a figure from the same paper showing these PDFs of the CCN concentration. And you can see that the modal values 
are indeed in the sort of say 10 to 50 um, per cubic centimeter uh, range. Uh, and um, Ritson et al. Uh, defined this cloud regime where we have really uh, very low CCN concentrations and these thin clouds that are very responsive in terms of both long wave and short wave effects as um, this tenuous regime. We're really right on the edge of having a cloud versus not having a cloud. Um, the other thing I want to point out about this regime is that um, perhaps these measurements um, may not actually capture all of the potential CCN, maybe in this regime, um, because concentrations are so low that we are able to, to activate even smaller particles than normal um, particles that we might normally associate with the Aiken mode, the, small, the smaller particles, um, and those perhaps are, are becoming uh, important for droplet concentrations in these clouds in this, in this regime. So with, with that uh, brief overview, uh, what I'm going to talk about today can really be broken into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about this low aerosol concentration regime where we're really worried about suppressing precipitation and changing the, uh, the optical thickness of these uh, tenuous clouds in the Arctic. And then in part two, what I'm going to do is shift focus to this higher aerosol concentration regime in, for non-precipitating clouds and compare and contrast what's occurring in the Arctic um, versus what's happening in the subtropics. All right, so for this first part, I have um, two main research questions that I want to address today. The first one is, is what is the role of the Aiken mode aerosol? Again, the Aiken mode are these smaller aerosol particles that don't typically act as CCN. Uh, so what is their role in these clouds when the accumulation mode or the uh, more typically sized aerosol particle um, concentrations is, is very low? And the second question is, is do we actually have clouds that's, that perhaps dissipate sometimes when the, when the aerosol concentrations are ultra low? Can we get an environment in the Arctic where the aerosol concentrations simply are not uh, large enough uh, to maintain clouds? And um, this idea really comes directly from the Maritzen paper that uh, I uh, showed earlier. So the, the first study here was, was published by Inez Bulatovic et al. in 2021 in ACP. Here's a link to the paper if you want more information. I'll have this up again later. Um, but what, what she did or what we did was run LES simulations with two different models. We ran Mimica, which is the model um, developed at Stockholm University where Inez and um, Annika Ekman are. And then I ran uh, simulations with RAMS. And we based this on an ASCOS case study. ASCOS was a field campaign that occurred in the high Arctic uh, in 2006, I believe, although I could be wrong about that. So we were using double moment cloud in aerosol physics, and we ran a number of simulations um, varying both the Aiken mode or small size mode concentrations. We used 20 and 200, and then we also varied the accumulation mode concentrations um, from zero to 20 per cubic centimeter. And I just briefly want to show you the results from this study that Inez published. And what I'm showing you here now is the difference between the high Aiken mode simulation, high concentration Aiken mode simulation, and the low concentration Aiken mode simulation. And it's the difference in the liquid water in the cloud. So this is a time height cross section, um, and you're seeing the difference. So red values here indicate that there has been an increase in the liquid water, and blue would indicate that there's a decrease in the liquid water. And uh, while we did find uh, some substantial differences between Mimic and RAMS, I think the qualitative story from both models was the same. And um, that is that when you have a low accumulation mode concentrations, these, these small Aiken particles that we normally neglect in terms of CCN are having a substantial impact on the liquid water in the cloud. Um, because in the absence of the accumulation mode particles, um, supersaturation gets higher than is, is typically associated with the clouds, and that high supersaturation allows the activation of these small particles. But as you increase the accumulation mode concentration from left to right on um, this figure, then as you would expect, the Aiken mode concentration becomes increasingly less important. And by the time you get to an accumulation, accumulation mode concentration of perhaps about 10 per cubic centimeter, the impact of the Aiken mode is, is really um, decreased dramatically. Um, so this would suggest then that perhaps even when we have low uh, traditional CCN concentrations as reflected in the measurements, that the Aiken mode can make up for that and provide additional um, particles for droplet uh, formation. Um, that said, 
what we find is that the Aiken mode concentration and the accumulation mode concentrations tend to be correlated. And if one is low, the other one is also low. Um, but that's what's being shown here in this, this figure from, from Ines's paper as well, um, where you, we see the, the PDFs of the accumulation mode particles for two different groups of the Aiken mode concentrations, one in blue when the Aiken mode concentration is low and one in orange when the Aiken mode concentration is somewhat higher. Um, and the, the PDF when the Aiken mode concentration is low is markedly shifted uh, to the left compared to the high concentration Aiken mode um, in uh, accumulation mode distribution in orange. Um, and so, so while yes, the Aiken mode seems to be important when the accumulation mode is, is low, um, it may not always be a way to say, save our clouds um, when the particle concentrations are, are getting low. And so um, that brings me to the, the next study that I, I want to show results from. Um, this is a study that was published um, by my student, Lucas Sturzinger, earlier this year, also in AC, uh, ACP. And what, uh, what Lucas did was he tried to find cases, observed cases, where we had um, clouds dissipating coincidentally with a rapid decrease in the aerosol concentration to something below 10 per cubic centimeter. And this is a total aerosol concentration, including um, Aiken mode and uh, accumulation mode. And so um, we actually found that this was, this was rather difficult to find, to find such cases. Um, these were some, three of really the best cases that we identified. The first one is labeled here OLI. This is from a Liktok point on the north slope of Alaska. Um, the second one is, is from the ASCOS field campaign. This is actually the same case that um, Inez was simulating in her study. And the third one is um, from Summit Station in Greenland. Uh, and so I think the nice thing about these cases that is that it really, they represent a variety of conditions, um, both in terms of meteorological conditions and um, surface conditions in which we are seeing a, a cloud dissipating, um, again, coincidentally with a drop in, in the aerosol concentration to 10 per cubic centimeter or less. So what we did then was we we decided to simulate all three of these cases. Um, this time we're using only RAMs. Again, we're using double moment cloud and aerosol physics. And what we did is uh, we allowed the simulations to, to spin up and enter into a sort of quasi equilibrium um, state. And then we instantaneously removed all of the aerosol. So this is very unphysical. Um, but the idea behind removing all of the aerosol instantaneously was to then watch to see how the cloud evolved and how the cloud dissipated um, after that instantaneous removal. And that that would tell us something about the fastest possible time it takes a cloud to dissipate due to a lack of aerosol particles. So um, from this perspective, this was more of a theoretical question. How fast can a cloud dissipate because it, it doesn't have aerosol um, to, with which to make new droplets? So here I'm, I'm showing you the, in blue, the observed liquid water path for each of these three cases. And in orange, I'm showing you the simulated liquid water path. Um, the difference between the solid line and the dashed line isn't particularly important. These are just, um, just a sensitivity test to the ice uh, treatment, but I don't think that the sensitivity test really changes the qualitative conclusions here. The red line indicates the time at which we removed uh, the aerosols in the simulations. So what you can see from, from these three studies is that quite obviously um, for a lift talk um, at the top and perhaps um, less convincingly for the, for the summit case that the simulated cloud dissipation is, is much longer than the observed dissipation, which suggests that these clouds are not actually dissipating due to a lack of aerosol particles. Um, in the lift talk case point, case in particular, I think that there's certainly evidence of some sort of um, frontal passage, so I don't think we were especially surprised about this one. Um, but in the ASCOS case, we actually do have a much closer agreement between observations and the simulations in terms of the liquid water decay. The other thing I want to point out about these cases is just actually how long it takes the clouds to dissipate. In both of these first two cases, the cloud takes um, about four to six hours to dissipate in the summit case, which was a much colder case than the first two. Um, it's, it's shorter, it's a, perhaps a one to two hours, but 
I think I was perhaps uh, myself a little bit surprised to see just how long it did take these clouds to dissipate, um, given a total lack of aerosol. I think it was longer than I would have expected to see. For the ASCOS case, I just want to show you a little bit more detail and, and the comment that even though the liquid water path observations and simulations seem to match reasonably well, um, the vertical structure of the clouds uh, in observations and the simulations don't match as well. So in, at the top here is, is radar reflectivity. On the bottom, I'm showing the, the liquid water uh, mixing ratio. So it's not exactly an apples to apples comparison, but what you can see nonetheless is that in the ASCOS case, we observed um, this kind of rapid decay in the cloud top. Um, and we really don't see that change in the cloud top in our simulations. Um, we do in the simulations have this simulated fog layer, which I'm not really sure what to make of. Maybe that's actually related to some of this low level cloudiness that we do see in the observations. But nonetheless, I think even though the liquid water path um, times decay time scale seems similar, I, I don't, there's under, I don't think we can conclusively say, and even in this ASCOS case, that the a lack of aerosols um, was associated or driving the dissipation in this case. Um, and then just briefly, I want to comment on how these clouds are dissipating. Um, I think there's there's two processes that you might think are at, at work here. One would be um, glaciation. Uh, through some kind of WBF process, another culprit could be evaporation. And we really think that the evaporation is, is the more important of these two processes. So we're showing um, budget terms here for the three cases. In red is, is condensation within the cloud. In blue is evaporation of rain below cloud base. Um, orange is precipitation that's actually uh, reaching the surface. And what you can see is that after we remove the aerosols at the red uh, dashed line, that the condensation really may uh, hold steady for quite a while afterwards, but it's really the precipitation that, uh, we, that we see rapidly increase and the evaporation of rain below cloud base. Um, even in the summit case where the precipitation can't reach all the way to the surface, we see this really strong increase in rain evaporation. Um, so indicating to us that this is not necessarily the WBF, um, but rather uh, formation of drizzle in the cloud uh, falling out and, and leading to the dissipation. So to summarize this first part, uh, the Arctic aerosol concentrations can be extremely low. And in that case, the Aiken mode particles can become important for cloud droplet formation. We saw that in the simulations and others have seen that, have seen evidence for that based on observations as well. And then we in the second study, we found that the cloud dissipation due to lack of aerosol particles can take hours and seems to occur primarily via precipitation, but that it's really difficult to find observed cases of dissipation that are consistent with our simulations of aerosol limited dissipation. And so um, it's not apparent at this point that this is a, an important mechanism uh, for Arctic clouds. Uh, but I, if anywhere it's going to be important, it's going to be in the high Arctic, and that's one of the places where it's most difficult to get observations. And so I would be interested to take a look at some of the uh, observations from the mosaic field campaign to see um, what was happening there. Okay, so moving on then to the second part of the talk where I wanna focus on what's happening now in this higher aerosol regime where we have non-precipitating clouds. So I'm showing you this figure again, so just to remind you um, where we were. And at the beginning, I didn't explain why we had a decrease in, in liquid water path with an increase in aerosol concentration. And so I want to do that now. And if you look in the literature, there's really two main um, ideas about why the liquid water path is decreasing um, with an increase in aerosol concentration. Um, the first idea is simply that by having um, more numerous but smaller droplets in these clouds that they can evaporate more efficiently. Uh, for a given total amount of liquid water. And if they can evaporate more quickly, um, then that can drive a decrease in the liquid water. And it can also drive an increase um, in the entrainment of that dry warm air from the free troposphere to, to further um, evaporate the cloud. The other idea is that with higher aerosol concentration, you have smaller droplets, of course, again, in the cloud. And that in particular, in this interface between cloud top and the uh, free troposphere, so this entrainment interface, that the sedimentation or the fall speed of these cloud droplets becomes important. 
And that if you can have with higher aerosol concentrations, a reduced fall speed for these droplets, then they're going to spend more time in this entrainment interface where they can evaporate. And this again will um, lead to a decrease in water in the clouds. So what I want to discuss in, in this part of the talk is, is, is this explanation of decreased liquid water path correct? And how is this explanation dependent on the environmental conditions in which the clouds exist? So in this next part, I want to present results from a paper published by Abby Williams and myself last year in GRL. And what we did in that study was we ran large eddy simulations of decoupled stratocumulus clouds in the Arctic based on the ISDAC field campaign. And um, additionally, so this is the non-precipitating case, the one I'll focus on. We also ran a case based on the ASCOS field campaign, which was precipitating. Um, we use, again, bulk microphysics. And importantly, I want to highlight that we did not have droplet sedimentation turned on in these simulations. So in terms of these physical processes that I said were important for the liquid water path increase, we're really not addressing at all the sedimentation uh, process, but really only this idea that smaller droplets evaporate more efficiently um, and lead to increased evaporation and decreased liquid water. So here's the precipitating case. This is the ASCOS case. On the right is the non-precipitating ISDAC case. And we ran for eight different uh, aerosol concentrations. And I'm showing the evolution of liquid water path in time for all of these simulations. For the precipitating case, we see um, initially an increase in aerosol will increase liquid water path as we would expect due to uh, suppression of the precipitation. But once the precipitation becomes fully suppressed, um, we see a reversal in that trend and a small decrease in liquid water. Whereas for the non-precipitating ISDAC case, we see a monotonic um, decrease in liquid water as we increase the aerosol concentration, as we would expect and consistent with previous studies. Um, also consistent with what I've discussed is that if we look at the evaporation rate at cloud top, we find that there's more evaporation with a higher aerosol concentration, um, again, as, as others have argued in the past. So everything it looks consistent um, with what we think we know. Um, but we were also looking at the cloud top radiative cooling rates. And what we noticed is that the, the cloud top radiative cooling rate, and this is the local cooling rate in terms of Kelvin per hour, not watts per meter squared, but Kelvin per hour right at the top of the cloud. Um, and these cooling rates um, depended on the aerosol concentration even when the liquid water path was, was greater than 50 grams per meter squared. And this came as a bit of a surprise because we know that once the liquid water path exceeds about 50 grams per meter squared, the clouds act like a black body and the amount of radiation emitted from them isn't especially sensitive to the details of either the droplet size or even how much water is in the clouds. Um, but we, here we see that, that we have, the behavior is not converging to um, in any way. And so we, we ran some offline radiation calculations using, using BugsRad to, to investigate this. So what I'm showing here first is the integrated cloud top radiative cooling rate. So this is the cloud top radiative cooling rate, the cooling rate integrated over the depth of the cloud and expressed in terms of watts per meter squared, which is the typical unit in which we see it. And um, when we do that, we see the expected behavior that as the liquid water path increases, we initially see an increase um, in this cloud top rate of cooling rate, but above about 50 grams per meter squared, there's no additional sensitivity to the liquid water. Um, the difference in the colored lines is the difference in the assumed droplet concentration, and the assumed droplet concentration also really doesn't have any impact above about, again, 50 grams per meter squared. However, the integrated cloud top rate of cooling rate was not what I was showing on the previous slide. Again, what I was showing on the previous slide was this maximum uh, cooling rate. That's a local cooling rate in terms of Kelvin per hour. Um, so if I, if I jump over here now to these profiles, these are the profiles of radiative cooling. If you integrate the profile of radiative cooling, you get the values over here. And if you just look at what the maximum local value is, then you get the values shown over here in panel B. And what we see is that this local maximum value of radiative cooling is dependent on the liquid water path. Even when the liquid water path is above uh, 50 gram per meter squared, 
and that this local rate of cooling rate depends on the assumption about the droplet concentration in the cloud. And so we, we don't see convergent behavior here um, when looking at this, this local maximum value. So the question we had then was, does the sensitivity to the local radio cooling rates have an impact on the cloud dynamics? And so we re ran the simulations, um, but we, we fiddled with the model code and we fiddled with it in such a way that the uh, radiation parameterization became insensitive to the droplet size. So it wasn't using the actual simulated droplet sizes, it was using one that we specified in the, in the model code. And what we when we did that, what we see is, that there is no longer any sensitivity of the liquid water path to the aerosol concentration. Um, the arrows here show the original range. And then furthermore, in our precipitating case, we got rid of our non-monotonic behavior that we saw previously. So this suggests actually that the radiation and the sensitivity of the radiative cooling to droplet properties um, is really important for driving this liquid water path decrease. In these in these sensitivity simulations, we went and re, re looked at the cloud top evaporation, and we see essentially what we would expect based on the previous slide, which is that there's no trend in the evaporation rates among the non precipitating um, clouds over here in the ASCOS case, and no trend really among any of the simulations in our non precipitating ISDAC case. Um, again, suggesting that it's really the radiative cooling sensitivity that's driving the changes to evaporation. So, what do these simulations um, suggest? They suggest that the liquid water path decrease in these non precipitating Arctic clouds are a result of increased evaporation. But the reason for the increased evaporation is not consistent with what we'd seen in published in the literature before. The reason that we saw increased evaporation is not because we have more efficient evaporation driven by smaller, more numerous cloud droplets, but what we found instead was that the increased evaporation is a result of changes in the maximum cloud top rate of cooling rates which increase um, the rate of dry air entrainment. And with more dry air entrainment, we get um, increased evaporation. Okay, so the question that we had after that was, does this, this change in our view of the physical processes driving liquid water path decreases hold up in subtropical stratocumulus clouds? Um, and also remember, we totally neglected droplet sedimentation in this in this study. And so, um, what happens when we go back and include droplet sedimentation? And so, in the last few minutes here, I want to talk about work that is ongoing in my group. This is is not published yet, but I think we have some interesting results that I'd like to share. So, we reran all of the ISDAT cases again. These are the non precipitating Arctic clouds to include the droplet sedimentation, and then we also um, have run the DICOMS to um, RF1 case, which is a case of a stratic, subtropical stratocumulus cloud with essentially 100% cloud fraction. And then we ran a variety of mechanism denial tests. So in the full physics tests, everything is normal as it, as it should be. In the deny all tests, um, we turn off all mechanisms essentially that could contribute to a liquid water decrease, and then the three in the middle we only allow one of the processes to act. So in the sedimentation test here, we have size independent radiation, size independent evaporation, um, but droplet sedimentation is on. Um, and then likewise for evaporation, we have size independent radiation, no droplet sedimentation, but normal treatment of evaporation um, and similarly for radiation. So the first thing I wanna show you is, is just a proof of concept. So if we look at what the change in the liquid water path is, this is a change, again, due to a change in aerosol concentration, due to an increase in aerosol concentration. Um, for both ISDAC and DICOMS in the full physics simulation, we see a decrease in the liquid water path as we would expect. Um, but in our simulation where we're trying to deny all mechanisms that impact the liquid water path, we do see essentially um, no change in liquid water path. So um, I think that's pretty good here in ISDAC, and it's really excellent here in DICOMS, um, where this is very, very close to zero, and I think at least two orders of magnitude smaller a change um, than when we have um, all processes acting. So I, I think that we've been reasonably successful in identifying all of the major processes that contribute to liquid water path changes um, for, for this study. Okay, so now what I'm showing you is, is the relative importance of each of these three processes, radiation, 
sedimentation and evaporation for changing the liquid water when you have an increase in aerosol concentration. In the ISDAC case, we see exactly what we saw in the Williams and Eigel study, which is that the radiation is, um, is by far the most important process uh, for controlling the liquid water path change with an increase in aerosol. But we see a very, very different story in DICOMs. Um, in DICOMs, the radiation is actually the least important of the three processes. And we see that sedimentation, which is the least important in the Arctic, becomes the most important in the subtropics. Um, and evaporation is, is in the middle. But overall, we actually have a much more even distribution in terms of relative importance of these three processes. Whereas in the Arctic, it's really just radiation that's driving um, the liquid water changes. So um, this is puzzling, and I would say that we are still working on understanding why we see such different behavior in the Arctic versus the subtropics. Um, but I want to share with you some of uh, the ideas um, and things that we've done to, to investigate this. So we have run um, a few variations on the DICOM setup to see if we can change this, rel this, this balance between the three processes and, and perhaps make it look more like the Arctic case. So I reran and I increased the strength of the inversion so it becomes much warmer in the free troposphere than before. I turned off the surface fluxes. Um, and then I also added more moisture to the free troposphere. And the, the only case really that had a, a large impact um, was the strong inversion case. And these other two without surface fluxes and the moisture free troposphere the, the total change in liquid water um, is different, um, particularly with the moist free troposphere, the change is reduced quite a bit. But what we find in these three cases is that the relative importance of the processes, the relative importance of radiation, sedimentation, and evaporation is holds well, pretty steady. There's really not a lot of change. The only change we saw was in the case with a strong inversion. And in this case, actually evaporation becomes the most important process. Um, and still doesn't look anything like uh, what's happening in the Arctic. So um, just some ideas about why we have some these different dominant processes. Um, it could be related to the relative strength of evaporative and radiative cooling. So what I'm showing you here for, for ISDAC and DICOMS is in blue, the profile of radiative cooling relative to cloud top and the profile of evaporative and condensational heating, again, relative to cloud top. And um, what you see is, is two things. One, that the radiative cooling peaks lower in the cloud. It's really slightly below cloud top where um, this is maximized. And two, that the relative strength of the radiative cooling and the evaporative cooling is very different in ISDAC versus DICOMS. In ISDAC, the evaporative cooling is really quite small compared to the radiative cooling, whereas in DICOMS, they're, they're very equal in terms of a, a maximum here near the top. Um, so this, this could be related, and uh, I think ISDAC is certainly set up to, uh, to care more about the radiative cooling. Um, that said, if I look at some of these sensitivity tests that I ran um, with the DICOMS case, I can, in, in the cases without surface fluxes and the moisture for troposphere, vary this this relative um, strength of the radiative cooling and the and the evaporative cooling, but as we saw, that didn't seem to really impact the relative strength of the different processes or the relative importance of the different processes. So I'm not sure it's really the absolute magnitude of these rates that seems to matter. Um, the other uh, another idea that we've been thinking about is is how quickly the entrainment is occurring. So here I'm just showing time height plots of the liquid water in these clouds, and you can see that for ISDAC. Um, the cloud top does not rise very quickly, which indicates that the entrainment rate is not very, not very fast, whereas in DICOMS, we see a much more rapid rise in cloud top, indicating faster entrainment into the cloud. Um, but I, especially with the strong inversion case, I was able to severely limit the amount of entrainment in the DICOMS case, and again, we don't see behavior that looks like the ISDAC case, so I don't think that the, um, the cloud top mixing time scale on its own um, is necessarily what's um, driving these differences, but I certainly would like to in investigate this, um, this more. Um, I think one idea that, that, that is maybe relevant is really just how much potential is there for the evaporation to change in the first place. Um, 
The dashed lines here now are showing the, the, the same profiles from the polluted case, uh, whereas the solid lines are, are showing the um, clean case. And we can see, of course, as we expect based on the results I've already shown, that we get large changes in the evaporation rate at cloud top. Um, and I think that that may just simply be related to the environment in which these clouds are, are existing, right? In the subtropics, temperatures are warmer, um, the inversions are stronger, particularly the water vapor inversion is stronger simply because it can be because the, the temperature is higher. Um, and so the water vapor inversion here is maybe on the order of, of five to eight grams per kilogram, where is, whereas in the Arctic, um, with, I mean, it would be physically impossible to get such a large um, vapor in, inversion because the temperatures are so much colder. And so the difference in vapor between the free troposphere and the boundary layer is only about 0.2 grams per kilogram. Um, and so in the, in the subtropics, it's gonna take a lot longer for the dry and trained air to become saturated. And so we have more time um, really for, for changes in evaporation rates um, to, to matter. Whereas in ISDAC, the air gets entrained and it's probably become saturated very quickly. And so it's, it's hard there for the evaporation rate to really matter. Um, yeah, so those are the ideas that we have so far. But again, like I said, that work is, is ongoing and I'm happy to talk with anyone about that more. But in summary, what we have found here is that the aerosol induced changes in cloud top radiative cooling rates seem to be a previously overlooked mechanism that's driving liquid water reduction in non-precipitating stratiform clouds. Uh, it seems to be really the dominant mechanism in, in, the, in the Arctic, um, but really only a secondary mechanism in the subtropical stratiform clouds. And again, that the reasons for, for why this importance of mechanisms is varying among our different cases is still unclear, but we think that um, it's, it's related to differences in temperature and, and moisture um, properties. Um, in the two regions. Um, so with that, uh, I conclude. And again, thank you for listening and inviting me today. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, so if anyone has any questions, um, you can go ahead and raise your hand um, in the chat, uh, or you can just type something and I'll, I'll call on you. Okay, maybe I can take the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, so, um, Adele, can you comment on, on the applications of um, aerosol cloud interaction for geo engineering? Um, for example, can we use a uh, um, cloud aerosol um, cloud uh, aerosol interaction to um, get more cloud and uh, reduce uh, reductive trans uh, reductive forcing and global warming? Yeah, I know that that's a topic that has received um, increasing attention, especially in recent years. I haven't thought about geoengineering specifically myself, but I, I, I think that the science behind the idea is, is relatively straightforward, that if you increase the aerosol concentration in these clouds, that you should be able to increase the reflectivity of these clouds. I think the real question is really in the, practic um, the practicalities of implementing such a procedure and whether we could really inject enough aerosol um, continuously enough uh, to, to maintain the sorts of changes in the cloud reflectivity that we need in order to impact the climate. And then, of course, what are all the consequences maybe that we haven't thought of, but yeah. Lauren, you can go ahead and ask your question. Oh, so, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, hi, Adele. Uh, thanks for the great talk. That was really interesting. Um, I had actually two questions. Yeah. Uh, so the first one is, uh, so you mentioned that some of the important factors for the, for the clouds are this, the radiation and the evaporative radiative cooling, um, among other factors, like you mm -hmm. also mentioned sedimentation and evaporation entrainment, that kind of thing. Yeah. But specifically for the radiation, I was wondering are, what like meteorological conditions do you think that are like, actually measurable might be associated with this evaporative radiative cooling? Uh, especially in the Arctic. I'm just thinking of this from the satellite perspective of how you might kind of try to capture that. And also I was wondering whether you are able to see differences in like polar day versus polar night when you would think that, I, I would think they, there might be some differences. Uh, so yeah, so let me answer the second part first. So in terms of um, polar day versus polar night, 
I I wouldn't necessarily expect there to be um, a huge difference. So one of the details that I kind of glossed over was that in the first study um, that I published um, with Abby, the Williams and Eigel 2021 paper, we actually only turned off the sensitivity, the size sensitivity to the long wave radiation parameterization scheme, not the short wave. And so by just changing the long wave, we, we saw that essentially total um, absence of a change in liquid water path. Um, and so since, of course, long wave is operating all the time in polar day mm -hmm. and polar night, I would expect um, not to see uh, especially large differences between the two cases. Okay. Um, unless those differences were associated with, with temperature or something like that. Um, and then in terms of observing it, I think, you know, this is always the question, right? It's really hard to observe processes um, from space or, or even in situ observations or ground-based um, remote sensing observations. And so I, yeah, I think that that perhaps if if we had a better idea or if, I, if yeah, if we had better ideas about when we would expect radiation to be important versus not, then maybe we could try to observe those conditions um, from space to, to understand a relative importance. But I, I, yeah, I think we might need to have more work on understanding the processes before we can try to um, glean something from observations. But I'm, I don't know, if you have any ideas, let me know. Okay, yeah, I'll think about it. Um, <laughs> Did I ask another question or? Yeah, do it. <laughs> okay, great. Um, also, so I just this is like a kind of comment question. Um, so the, for the for the first part of your talk, you were talking about these small Aitken mode particles. Um, and I think you, from what I understood, you kind of ultimately concluded that, you know, maybe they don't matter much of the time except in specific locations or times. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and I just wanted to mention that kind of some some of the satellite work, satellite work that I've been doing also finds that from a different perspective and, and some of the modeling work because my understanding is that you also the in order for those particles to matter they also require really clean conditions from an aerosol perspective because yes. if you have large aerosol particles they'll coagulate onto those large larger particles oh sure mm -hmm. and, and so and so actually what turns out that the Arctic is hardly ever clean enough for them to matter, I think. I, I don't haven't published this yet, but anyways, it's just okay. a, it's a chat. I was wondering if you had comments on that. Yeah, so we, um, in, in none of the simulations, did we have um, that sort of aerosol physics on? I, I It might've been present in the MIMICA simulations. I don't know enough about their aerosol physics package to know if, if things like coagulation are accounted for, uh, but I know I don't have it in RAMS. Um, and so that certainly that's something not not something that we had considered um, previously. So that yeah, yeah. Anyways, I think it would like just further kind of support your obs your your conclusions, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I saw um, Santiago have his hand up for a second. Um, Santiago, do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. It's a comment, kind of follow up, following up on on. Uh, Lauren's comment because I, I'm trying to see this from the viewpoint of satellite. How can we, yeah, you know, and the satellite and and I, I believe uh, and I have the impression that uh, perhaps uh, if you can, I mean, at least in, in, I was when you were showing your simulations talking about liquid liquid water path change of uh, heating rates at the top of the cloud and and I was putting that in the context. Okay, what are, what satellite products are out there that you can use or and but it, it, you you brought up the issue of uh, a time scale. I mean, the time that a cloud you know takes to evaporate or not evaporate or see something and and that's something that is is the new player in this game is uh, geostationary with all these. And of course, you don't get a good view of that and the high latitudes. So that's why I encourage you to look more into the subtropical that you mentioned, because you, you yeah. might be able to get an observation. I mean, particularly the, uh, you know, with, you know, with pictures every 10 minutes, I mean, you have to figure out something <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in some way. So, uh, Anyway, it's just a general comment. I I I I, I yeah. encourage you to look into that. Yeah. No. Thanks for the thanks for the comment. Any other questions? Okay. 
Well, unless um, someone interrupts me right now, which they're free to do, I think we're I think we're good. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending, and thank you so much, Professor Eigel, um, for giving us this great talk. Um, I hope everyone. Oh, and just as a as a reminder, we will have um, more talks this week, but they will be in person. They're on Thursday. Um, you guys probably all got all got an email from me this morning about our Oktoberfest. Um, so I hope that I see you all there. And if I don't, then I hope I'll see you next week as we continue our seminar series. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Um, have a good day. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm.